Hello and uh, welcome to the next in the series of our Birdies House Building Conversations. Uh, my name is Elaine Farson Black and as most of you know I'm a partner in our house building team specialising in the planning aspects of all residential developments and especially new builds. And today we're going to be discussing biodiversity as part of master planning and placemaking of residential developments and I'm delighted to be joined by Paul McDonald who's a finding director of Optimise Environments, otherwise uh, known as OPEN. Now, Paul studied landscape architecture and architecture at Edinburgh College of Art, Heriot Watt University, and graduated in landscape architecture in 1993 and a Master of Architecture in 1997. He's worked with both private and public bodies on major master planning, urban design and regeneration projects throughout the UK, and abroad and I know that Paul is currently part of um, the teams working on designing new communities in places like Shawfair, Winchborough, Greater Blind Wells all in the Central Belt and Countess Wells um, up here in Aberdeen and of course in other places throughout the UK. Um, despite that he also still finds time to be a visiting lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and is an associate with Planning Aid Scotland. So, Paul, thank you for giving up your time and joining us um, today. Now, um, the background to our chat um, and background to many chats that I seem to have these days is NPF4, um, and that sets out the National Spatial Strategy for Scotland. And, and from your point of view and what I want to kind of focus on today, it, it's highlighting that Scotland's natural environment and the natural capital that it supports, um, it underpins our economy. And so one of the key aims of the strategy is to restore biodiversity loss and planning is seen as having a critical role uh, in supporting the delivery of a new Scottish biodiversity strategy. I think we've had one for a while. This is now going to go up to 2030. Um, and just diving straight into NPF4, policy three is headed nature crisis. What does nature crisis mean or what does it mean to you? Um, well, hello, um, Elaine. Um, I better say that first. Um, nature crisis. Well, it's a pretty big question, but I think it's one perhaps maybe best kind of answered as an in, as an individual, maybe, um, because uh, the way we kind of look at it, the way I look at it anyway, it's I mean, each 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 one of us is part of nature. We're humans. We're part of that system and, and, and things like that. Um, so. In, in creating this crisis, this, this nature crisis, and, and I think it definitely is one, we've kind of quite ignorantly harmed ourselves and everything kind of around us. Um, and I think it I think it goes hand in hand with the kind of climate emergency, you know, doesn't it really? But there's 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 one fact that just to kind of cut through it that as an individual that sometimes I use when I'm you know teaching at teaching at the uni. I mean, since I was born 1970, just in case you're wondering. Um, world population has gone from 3.7 to 7.7 7 billion. So in, in my generation, it's got it's more than doubled. But in the same time, you know, as a well-known UN fact that you know all you know the the biodiversity of the planet, you know, mammals, reptiles, you know, um, fish, whatever, um, has gone down down by 68%. And when we're teaching master planning and all that sort of stuff at uni, that's one of the points to start with, because we should be taking care of the land that we are actually using. Very precious resource. I and mean, if that sort of fact doesn't keep you up at night, I don't know kind of what will. So it's nice to start with a bit of a shock, but um, I think nature is very resilient. And, um, and I think the management of our natural places um, and not so natural places is really is really, is really key in that. Um, so I think NPF4 having that policy three in is great, um, but I think like the NPF4 there's a lot of shoulds, woulds and whatever. It does set the strategy, how it's delivered is, is the key thing and how we act upon it. So that's, yeah, and, that's how I think about it anyway. Yeah, and I suppose development is probably seen always as, uh, as the bogeyman for that reduction, as, as you said, you know, in biodiversity, development is, is, is probably being seen as the contributor to that. So now policy three is taking development in, 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 back and saying, right, you now need to contribute 
to the enhancement of biodiversity. Yeah. So it's looking through development to restore degraded habitats and strengthen, you know, nature networks and 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 um, you know, kind of connections. And all that's being done through planning design, which is, you know, exactly your bag. And um, you know, so is it new or is it something that you've been doing? you know, in developments for, for years. It's not something the house builders need to necessarily worry about in inverted commas. It, it, it's an increased focus of something that you've been doing for years. Oh, I think, um, you know, definitely the way we go about it from, let's say from an open perspective or, or from a landscape kind of perspective. Yeah, it is the way you're taught. It's the way you're taught to to kind of look at things. And I think obviously it's come under more scrutiny recently and quite rightly, but it hasn't changed the way we as a practice can kind of go about it. So from, from our perspective, it um, you know, for us as mass buying, it's how it all kind of comes together. And it's not understanding the land, you know, when you first see that piece of land that either developer or a landowner kind of comes to you, and being honestly being able to read the land, um, you know, as a landscape architect and architect, each has its place, do you know, um, it's not one all over the other, it's a bit about the kind of timing of that. So understanding capacity for land to change, understanding the need also for homes and jobs and a healthy lifestyle and to create a place you love. So it, it, it's, it's, yeah, you could say that's where we kind of come in, but there's lots of people involved in that and um, we don't necessarily see ourselves as the sole provider of, let's say, green infrastructure. There are so many disciplines that kind of feed into that. And, and generally, it, it should be more an approach to development, should be more of an infrastructure-led approach in, in its widest sense, and I include the green and the blue. Um, but I think that uh, you, you talked there about the developer and house building being kind of the, the bogeyman in that or whatever or the cause of that. Um, we need homes, don't we? You know, the population we've just talked about has more than doubled it in our generation. Um, so we need to do that and we need to lead, you look at the land as a resource, a very precious resource. So we must use it efficiently. And I think I think that's where we come in. I think our ability to open to understand landscape and provision of houses or whatever other development and how that the system works together is um is what is what we're really passionate about so it's not just about one or the other it's how they actually kind of come together uh, kind of come together i think so and of course we favor i suppose if you've got a style of nature based kind of solution in achieving that um and i think we believe that's the right first step to do so that underpins everything yeah, no, and I think that's right. And you mentioned, it, you know, kind of earlier, it's it's that combination, isn't it? It's a nature crisis, it's climate change, it's a housing crisis. Oh, we, yeah. you, it and it is about, I like, the, you know, your, the, the kind of ecosystem, they've all got to, um, you know, exist together and do it in a way that meets all the varying kind of needs. Yeah, you know, I mean, you said, you know, you're talking there about us providing the green in, green infrastructure. Um, that's the only way to do it from our perspective, but it's only the starting point to allow the context for everything else to, to kind of feed into. We're so too quickly jump into sites and don't understand the sites we're dealing with. And sometimes that causes quite financial difficulties later on. So if we can read the land and understand it, we can understand what the best method of integrating other systems to it from, you know, homes and kind of other development but I mean um, you know so I suppose I think you know you talk about you know um, uh, you know from from our perspective it's context driven it's nature first that if you do that I firmly believe that you know you talk about the, the, there's the four pillars of the NPF4 and I don't really know these things right but the sustainable livable what is the other one productive and distinctive if yeah. you did Deal with context first and understand the piece of land. You can give good good advice. These four aims or these four kind of uh, areas will fall out of that if you deal with it, you know, con you know, kind of conscientiously and um, and 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 you're able to read it. You know, um, and I know 
we've talked about counties wells many times you know and it's an obvious example for that it just the client that kind of just let us go with that it was about starting with green infrastructure setting that not worrying about the development but setting that making the land site work and function and then the architecture and the building and the places then can respond to that and and that's what makes it distinctive and that's what hopefully make that attractive for people to come and live in because it stands out from the rest doesn't it so indeed it's it's award-winning your um kind yeah. of the part that, that that runs through it um you know so far the policy in scotland doesn't um require a specified amount of net diversity you know biodiversity gain in, in england you do but you are going to have to show that the site is demonstrably better. It's a in a demonstrably better state than it would have been without intervention. Um, what does that mean? It's and it sounds to me, you know, and, and um, this might not be correct. Is it easier to show that in a brownfield site that may be, you know, kind of run down? Um, it's been previously developed, so it might not have a lot of biodiversity, or uh, compared to that kind of greenfield site where everybody assumes. Well, it's greenfield. It's it's already green. It's going to be quite hard to show an improvement. So yeah. Maybe kind of talk of your experience of the difference between well, biodiversity and brownfield and greenfield. Yeah. Well, um, I think well, firstly, in England, you know, um, and, and and we've got a lot of work there, you know, through um, throughout this uh, the whole um, the whole south southeast up through Manchester, and that's so a lot of new settlements so very familiar with that but you know I mean in England have a, a general 10% minimum target you know and and to be honest it's a minimum target as well um you need targets we can't have demonstrably better that's just not who is go who on earth is going to judge that seriously um and that comes back to actually a previous question uh, uh, something I kind of maybe didn't didn't quite answer was that who is going to decide if it's demonstrably better. There isn't there isn't the skill in the planning system to allow that to happen. There isn't the resource, and I mean that you know, genuinely, because the planning system really needs to be able to understand and enforce and monitor, and it can't do all those things. So at least um, in England, we've got, we've got the 10%. It's measured before the site starts, and it's measured as it goes on. And I think it's a 30-year process. It's, it's meant to be looked at as a 30 year process. It's a good target and it's a minimum. So we don't have this and, and I think we kind of need to. But also in England, it's not a legal requirement just yet, I don't think. That's um, but hopefully I think they're trying, trying to get that to happen. And, and to be honest, I think that is pretty key. I think we need that too, um, because it needs to be measurable and accountable. If it's not accountable, it's not enforceable and it's never checked up on again and it, it just uh, in, in, in our experience it just it just doesn't work um but your comment on green versus brown really interesting we have quite a lot of debate of that in the office um a lot of our brownfield sites and i mentioned this earlier are you know nature's really really resilient give it time listen to your you know um, David Attenborough, and he'll, he'll talk about resilience and hope. And some of our Brookfield sites are really diverse. Um, and so it's not, you can't verse one off against the other. You need to understand the site from the beginning. I think it's very site specific. Um, and actually, if moving on from the England English kind of 10% minimum, um, I think that we probably have to have different targets for different types of sites, I think. Not quite sure what that is yet. We're working on a big project in, in Colchester just now, which is um, like one of the new garden garden settlements. And we're having, it's a green field, you could say it's farmland. Farmland's not very biodiverse at all. Um, and um, we're actually finding some of the so, um, some of the adjacent land that is, uh, it's not quite brownfield, but it's been used for extraction in the past is very biodiverse. It's been left because it hasn't been used as agriculture. It hasn't had pesticides. So there's a whole different thing. So you can't see one versus the other, I think, in that. Um, 
so I think, so for developers perhaps, I think if we're aiming to get 10% or more, it's actually possibly in our minds something to shout about. Mm -hmm. It's actually a public is very aware, as you know, um, and I think, you know, not just the public, but we're seeing it definitely in, in the corporate world um, in terms of uh, corporate responsibility. But as individuals, I think we all want to now live in a world that is, uh, is enhancing our surroundings, aren't we? You know, we kind of need to do that. And if, 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 some, if anything, the, what the pandemic has done has, has kind of highlighted that, you know, um, and I, I think you know, if I was, it's equally valid to say that, you know, why that I've chosen a place to live that's enhancing the, you know, diversity of the area, the biodiversity of the area by 20%, by 30%. What's wrong with that? That That's that's something to be proud of and it's something to sell. And I think some developments are really grasping that. I have to say some of the projects south of the border are probably grasping it a bit more, maybe because the competition's bigger. So they're competing with each other, which is brilliant because they're competing to outdo each other. And the, and this is the hot, the really hot topic. So it's great to do that. And and you, you said there that, you know, there might need to be different um, kind of targets for different types of development. Um, I suppose just, I suppose, can you give us some examples of how you might um, use mechanisms, you know, to um, to increase biodiversity within different types of developments, you know, uh, is it is it beehives, you know, on roofs in the city, you know, yeah. is it is it living walls, green roofs, you know, what kind of things might developers um, be having to introduce to their developments? Um, it's a really really good question, and it's probably not something that could be answered in a couple of minutes, I'm afraid. But um, you know, we need to bring nature back to our doors. Um, and that's really important and we need to look after it and we need to live with it but that requires a bit of education too i think from 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 us all whether it's new it's rural it's urban it's flats there's different ways of doing it you know um and and once we bring nature back to the doors in different ways then and we're comfortable with that then that's a start um i would have said so just to answer the question maybe just as an example i think every intervention or every time you bring nature back it should be site specific so you need to understand the site so it's the type of nature you're bringing back um so from working with that uh what is there enhancing it creating you for instance you know we talked about countess wells about the drainage the agricultural drainage was very inert opening up into a new water course bringing that through that's a very rural element to do in in that in that case um where it's preserving hedgerows where we're looking at in colchester just now where there's quite inert fields but very rich hedgerows these hedgerows are the most important thing on the site so as we develop it they need they form the structure of the new site um so all these things create distinctiveness um uh, for instance more urban sites working on newtown quarter in the middle of edinburgh just now uh, purely as a landscape architect um, uh, on on that one, but making use of every spare space of the building. So um, the roofs of the building are accessible, you know, uh, that's nothing new, but they're also green, they're also biodiverse, the species are, is, are correct for that. So you eke out every little piece. And um, so from the, the Countess Wells Rural to um to the new town quarter in edinburgh and lastly you know um we've just won a little competition with that um down down in england uh, called the william sutton prize and it's an environmental prize and it's run by the clarion housing group which are the biggest social landlord in the uk and our our aim was to create a green toolkit it was a bit of a a theory or research kind of based kind of approach but it was to, it was inspired by you know when you go into developments you have um, you have your your travel plan or your travel pack you know all those little simple little things that people that people do so um, so we thought we'd create a green toolkit and this was specifically for existing developments as well as as well as new developments that you could give a little toolkit to how people could start to in introduce nature themselves to their own 
little square meter of land, their garden, their allotment, and it went up in scale. Right up to the point where it was about understanding how you could learn from other people. So we had this series of programs that could be implemented depending on the development. So we're looking actually in recent discussions with Clarion um, to look at five or six of their existing projects to try and introduce that. So, um, so that was about education. It's not about we're going to design this big thing and do this, that. It was about just maybe pe making people aware of what they could do as an individual. So um, we're hoping to we're hoping to start to roll out some test examples of that um, very, very soon. So. No, I, I quite like that because it's that individual responsibility as well, isn't it? It's not just the developers because the developer is there, to, you know, to, to builds it, moves on, and then you've got the householders who are the ones that are actually then the stewards of the land, you know, kind of they're, they're after. So having a, I like that, having a toolkit when you go in, because you're right, often it's here, there's a kind of green travel plan that tells you where the near bus, nearest bus stop is and all that, but actually the practical advice about then maintaining you know the um the the nature side of it is it is really interesting um it's linked to that and you kind of touched on it as well in terms of the the pandemic because another policy in npf4 is is at policy 12 and it's about the greener healthier places that we need you know kind of within our developments and it's it's that blue and green infrastructure um that that we've kind of talked about as well but having that ex accessible you know on your doorstep you know the live local everybody being um having those opportunities to enjoy nature and kind of open space um you know easily um my understanding is we still use kind of open space standards from sports scotland from um you know kind of many years ago do we need to be looking at different you kind of open space standards and you know what you should have close by and I'm throwing questions at you now yeah. I, I presume it's easier to design those into new big developments and harder when you're doing a brownfield site that's in an existing location and that kind of open space is already mm. there or not there um the sports scotland one is an interesting one um it's there we refer to it every now and again I wouldn't say we follow it. It's there for a reason, though. We we also use field and trusts or beyond the six acre standard, all those sorts of things. Um, um, and all these things are just a starting point. And I think the aim that we look at is it's just we need to keep well, we need to keep the population healthy, don't we? <laughs> because there's an actual financial knock on effect of that to the NHS. So we need to keep people healthy. And I suppose COVID and lockdown has seen how important all sorts of spaces are. It's amazing. Everybody has used every piece and it continues now, even though we've stopped. So I think I think I think that's really I think that's really important. Um, so I suppose um, I think we need to be designing spaces that I suppose are multifunctional um, and work with their other green and blue systems if you want to call them that. And I think we need to also recognise that not everybody needs a pitch or a court. Um, I think we need to expand the opportunities for play and sport and public realm and spaces. It needs to be more, as I said, you know, uh, multifunctional. Um, and you know, so um, and I think the use through COVID and through lockdown of our open green spaces has been, I think, maybe not a revelation to us, but a revelation to everybody else of what the, about what is possible comes back to education and making people people see other people doing doing things. But above all, I think it's about quality of space that's provided and the thought about the different ways people can keep healthy, can access space. It's well positioned, it allows opportunity to kind of happen. Um, but we're having this nice round of discussion, but we're having another discussion on another project just um, at the end of last week. And for instance, if you come back to Sports Scotland and you might want to put down an artificial pitch, the most least biodiverse thing you could ever, ever put down, right? But actually, you might only need one of those rather than four grass pitches. And four grass pitches are not that biodiverse either, which might give us more space for development, but might give us more space for other bio biodiversity. So it's, it's, it's not all linear and green. 
um, sometimes we, we just need to think a little bit wider and a little bit uh, smarter about what's what's the right facility um, within that. Which is back to kind of where you started in terms of, you know, understanding the land. I like that, you know, you suggest you have to read the land um, and, and work out what is right for that development in that location and, and potentially, I suppose, what existing nature networks there are around it that you then have to be part of because it's about that connection, isn't it? You know, we have like the proposals for the central green space right throughout Scotland so that you can kind of have that connectivity both for recreational purposes, but for wildlife and biodiversity so that, you know, nature can can make the travels kind of as, as well. So it is that understanding the much bigger picture, which is your your role in it, isn't it? Can I, just because you mentioned CSGN, um, just in that one, which I think is great. And we all play a part in that and how it all starts to come together. And it's having that wider picture. I love the wider picture this, of how these things kind of work. And I'm just I'm just making a pitch, um, uh, not a personal pitch, but it's not just about Central Scotland. And I find it slightly frustrating sometimes. I think the management of our wider country side um, and especially in Scotland, which is so diverse, um, needs to be considered too from a from a uh, a government level, and uh, particularly west coast of Scotland, northwest coast, which is through COVID and lockdown has been has been hammered. Um, and um, if if stopping short of anything becoming another national park, things like that need to be managed as well because. Um, that's equally important as to where the population is here in in the central belt. There's different strategies for different parts of the country, and I think they need to be developed more. And I'm saying that from a an individual, but also from a landscape architectural point of view of being aware of the importance of our wilder landscapes in that. So I know we're talking about development and such, but um, they are a, they are a resource in a very small country. So, but so the CSGN one is is really important. But I wish I only wish it was bigger than that. Do you know? Yeah, so. no, and 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 I so say that's almost kind of where we started in terms of um, NPF four recognizing how important the natural environment is to Scotland and Scotland's economy. You know, and the tourism part of that is is a key kind of part um, as, as well. Um, just a kind of final sort of kind of question. Um, because we've in in that discussion. It's almost like assuming that we're always going to be able to provide that um, biodiversity and that and that kind of gain in England. You know, my understanding is developers can offset any failure to achieve that kind of percentage uh, net gain by by offsite contributions to local projects. Um, is this? Do you think we're going to see that happening in Scotland? If you can't deliver, it'll be another um, part on the developer contributions, the shopping list. Is it an, another part that we're going to have to put in um, Section seventy five agreements? Um, depends if I ever want to get another job or not. Again, doesn't it really? Um, <laughs> and to be honest with you, I really think it probably needs to happen. Only from the point of view that I. I believe it's as important as any of the other normal uh, Section 75 con contributions we do. It also makes it legally binding, doesn't it? Really, in the end, it certainly heads towards that. Um, so if there's no other way to do it, then we we'll probably need to be thinking like that. But I would hope that house builders and developers would see, would see the value of what open and green space does quite commercially to their square foot. Because that's because that's what it makes a difference. You tell different stories to different people, but it does make a difference to the square foot. Every developer we've worked with, once we've convinced them to do and to move in a certain direction, it might not be the mix they started out with when they put their bid in on the site, but the value has to go up, and we're we're not short on understanding that. And that value goes up by the quality and the uniqueness and the distinctiveness of what you do. 100%. Been doing it for hundreds of years, but we kind of forgot about it from the, about the 1950s on. But we did. We did. All, all our estate owners made the best, most beautiful places because they wanted to attract people and they wanted people to work there and live there and contribute to their e economic success. I don't think that I don't think that's changed. There's nothing to be ashamed of at all. 
Um, so going back to section 75, if that's the only way to do it, yes, but it should that should only ever be measured about what is actually achieved on site. And if it's the developer's viewpoint of that is to do something distinctive that increases biodiversity and all the rest of it and access to nature, then that will only help their own development. It's not, it's not um, a chain around your neck. It definitely is not. So it's our responsibility with public awareness and all, all that sort of stuff um, to be adding value to the place. And, uh, and there's that old adage about um, you don't select the house you want to live in, you select the place. So just so to developers and house builders, unashamedly make it as distinctive as you can. And um, that is about working with the place. That's that's where all the signs are, are from. So. And as you say, that's the kind of four pillars um, that sit behind MPF4, as you kind of um, suggested. So kind of final question, because that's been that's been um, fantastic. We've covered um, lots of things and um, lots of things for um, house builders to kind of think about. But you, you mentioned there about you don't select the house, you select the place. And one of the questions, the final questions we've been asking all our guests is, OK, if you were going to move home, who would you select as your uh, neighbour and why? <laughs> um, I know you just alerted me to this question a, a, a little moment ago, but um, nothing new to deep and meaningful. But uh, to quote Jerry Rafferty, he would have Billy Conley to the left of him and Mick Jagger to the right. And if you know the rest of the song, you'll know where it's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for sharing uh, your kind of thoughts um, with us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, listening and goodbye. OK, thank you very much. Bye bye.